Good afternoon, friends. Good to be with you on this Friday, April the 24th, for our time together as uh, we gather virtually as friends and members of First United Methodist Church of Morristown. And uh, as we come together on this day, uh, quite a rainy day outside, um, it feels like it's been rainy and cold for a long time now. I'm waiting for those wonderful late April or early May days when it's uh, kind of in the 60s and sunny and you're able to be outside more, but unfortunately not yet, and it looks like not for a few days. Um, so we'll just have to wait for that as a, as a, a gift um, to us eventually. Uh, we'll get that warm weather and be able to spend some time outside, especially as we go through uh, the time of pandemic and being quarantined and being inside. I'm, I know I'm going a little bit stir crazy myself. So, uh, yes, Beth, my cup does say golf. <laughs> this actually belonged to my dad. Uh, my dad discovered golf later in life after he retired, and uh, he was a bit of a golfaholic in some ways. Um, he enjoyed it. He didn't take it seriously, and that's the way I approach golf, too. I don't take it seriously either. So, good morning, Cindy. Good to see you on this morning. Hope you and Al are, are doing well today. Uh, speaking of uh, golf and, and sports, as many of you know, I'm a... Um, I'm a sports fan. I, I do like different types of sports. I, I played uh, baseball, especially when I was uh, younger. Uh, played soccer, um, basketball. Everyone says, "Oh, did you play basketball?" Because you're six foot four. And yeah, I did play basketball for a while. Good morning, Jim. Good to see you too. And uh, Jane, good to see you on and, and joining us. Um, yeah, so I, I played a lot of different sports, and I have to admit that, um, well, sometimes I'm, I'm missing watching some sports on TV, um, and that reminded me because I saw this, uh, this baseball outside. It came from a, across the street where uh, there's a field, and, and again, I'm in my, my childhood home here today, <clears throat> not in Morristown today, I'm actually up in, in Chatham, and across the street where I, I grew up, maybe I'll take you on a tour one of these days, but um, there's a ball field right across the street, and it's great because that's where I played Little League and uh, played soccer over there. And anyway, once in a while you get a foul ball that lands on the front lawn of uh, my mom and dad's house. And uh, so this was probably from last year, and I saw it sitting in the dining room, and I, I picked it up and I thought, man, of all the things that were, were missing... Uh, through this time. Um, missing being with people, missing worship, um, missing just connection through the different fellowship events that we have, and, and that's just in church and all the things that we miss other than that as well. So this baseball is kind of symbolic to me today, thinking about <clears throat> all the things that we're, we're missing out on as we continue to be quarantined, but, but it's also a sign of hope. Baseball to me is always a sign of spring, and uh, with spring comes new life, and we know that eventually new life will come to us through uh, the end of this, uh, this time of quarantine. And yeah, things are going to be different. We know that for sure, but hopefully things will be getting uh, better as well. So let's see who else has checked in so far this morning. Looks like we have oh, Richard. Good to see you joining us, and good morning to you, or good afternoon, I should say. And Sarah is back with us today, and, and Tracy, good to see you. Hope the family is uh, doing well. Hope you're keeping those kids busy. I'm sure that's not easy, being home. Uh, and Dennis, Dennis, good to see you. Hope you're doing well, too. It's great to see and, and connect with Joan on occasion now, and good to have her back, not in the quote-unquote office. Obviously, she's not in the office, but um, just great to see her in Zoom meetings and getting back involved in the life of the congregation uh, following her, her cancer treatment, so that's great. Susan, good to see you, too. Good morning to you. Or good afternoon. I keep saying good morning. It's good afternoon, I guess, at this point, right? Is it afternoon yet? Uh, yeah. Oh, it just is. Okay. Well, you can still say good morning, I suppose, but technically it's afternoon. So anyway, the baseball is kind of like my object lesson for this morning, that uh, we have hope. <laughs> we have hope for the future. And, uh, and despite everything that's going on around us and people um, getting this terrible virus, and, and it's so random in some ways as to who gets it in a bad way and who doesn't. Um, and then people who you wouldn't expect to, to die from it are, are dying, and people who you would expect to, that would impact greatly, are, are pulling through, and that's just, uh, that's the wonderful part of it, but um, it's just affecting all age groups in different ways, and it's almost, it's just so random, it's hard to tell. But anyway, the baseball to me provides hope, so I hope you look at this baseball and you think of spring, you think of new life, 
Uh, we just celebrated Easter, and uh, to me, baseball is a part of, of that ritual every year. So hope you like baseball. If you don't like baseball, forget what I just said. <laughs> but I, I do enjoy it, and having played it for so long, too, I, I really enjoy it. Anyway, we are moving through the Gospel of John, <clears throat> and I have my Bible here in front of me. And feel free to take out a Bible if you like. I, I use the New Revised Standard Version. It's a, a good translation of the Scripture. Translation, to me, is really important. Um, because translation gets to the original text. Um, if you really want to do Bible study in a, you know, in a, in a, in a scholarly way, you might say, of course, you have to know the original text, but, and I'm not that good with it. I'm just good enough to be dangerous, I guess, in some ways, but I rely on the experts with that. And the New Revised Standard Version is a pretty good translation of, of Scripture. Um, of course, there was a translation called the Revised Standard Version, the RSV, for many years. And um, in some ways, I prefer the Revised Standard Version to the New Revised Standard Version. But um, any translation is, uh, um, you know, that has any, any worth to it is, is good. The NIV, I enjoy that one, too, for more of a um, spiritual, introspective reading of Scripture. But any sort of deep dive, um, I always go to the RSV or the NRSV. So just a little bit of... Um, a word about translations. When translations are real important, and you can you can see when you compare different passages how important they can be. Anyway, um, all that's to say, yesterday we uh, this is our third day in focusing on this story, and I'm taking my time with this story because it is really a, a pivotal story in the Gospel of John. To me, things are turning now as Jesus is going to be moving uh, towards Jerusalem uh, for the final time. He's he's in Jerusalem still, but he's when I say towards Jerusalem, I mean towards that time of his arrest and crucifixion. Um, and so he uh, finds himself still there, and as we said the other day, um, he is in Jerusalem, but no longer in the temple precinct, but he is surrounded by the religious leaders. We think a small group of religious leaders when he goes to this, uh, this pool at uh, Siloam. And we talked about a little bit of the introduction yesterday, um, the first 12 verses of this story, when this man who was blind from birth, is healed. And if you remember, we talked about the rich symbolism that John uses here in this particular part of Scripture where Jesus had just said in chapter 8 that I am the light of the world, and now he's showing that in a real tangible way by healing this man who has been uh, born blind. And it puts the religious leaders in a bit of a bind, as we're going to see in a moment, because Jesus heals on the Sabbath, which technically breaks the law, he is labeled a sinner because of that. It breaks the law of Torah, of doing work on the Sabbath. And yet, how could someone not be from God who was doing these incredible works, these signs, these miracles, as Jesus is doing in these stories that we find in John? Mm, that's good coffee. Um, anyway, so we are continuing. Sorry about the telephone ringing. It should stop in a moment. If it doesn't, I will go hang it up. Um... I'll do that. Just be right back. Nothing but telemarketers now that my mom is, uh, has passed away. We just get a whole bunch of telemarketers calling here. Anyway, uh, back to the scripture. So we're going to begin in verse 13 today. And when we left off in verse 12, there is this whole question about... Um, about this level of the man's belief and where Jesus is at this point and the questions that he is receiving from people, uh, the neighbors especially, his, his, his neighbors, the people who knew him daily as this beggar, right, saying, what happened? Wasn't this the man who was blind from birth and now he can see what's going on here? And uh, he basically says, I, I don't know. I just know this man's name is Jesus and I know what happened and that's it. So now we're going to move on to the uh, Pharisees. The Pharisees apparently are entering the scene here. Um, they are probably small in number, we think, because we hear from a lot of, a lot of them in verse 13 and following. So that's where we'll, we'll start this morning is with verse 13. Uh, verse 13. Um, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. They brought, now who's they? Probably these neighbors, um, if we go back to the previous verses. But they bring to the Pharisees the man who has been born blind, formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath. And here's the first indication in the story that it is the Sabbath. We didn't know that before, but now we know it. It was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. 
Okay, so the fourth evangelist here, John, is inserting a, a note here about this, that it was the Sabbath. the first time that we're, we're hearing this, as I said, the first indication in this account. And uh, so Jesus, is, again, is, is not letting this stop him. Um, these works that he's doing, these signs, are happening on the day of Sabbath. And it's causing controversy that he performs a work on the Sabbath, which, as I said, technically is, is against uh, the rules, but that doesn't stop Jesus. So, now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. So there's um, uh, sort of a subtlety happening here, I think, beginning in verse 15. Um, it's almost like the man himself is on trial. He's being judged in some way. Listen to that again in verse 15. The, the Pharisees also began to ask him <clears throat> how he had received his sight. Um, in a sense, they're saying, how did this happen to you? What's, what's going on here, right? Um, but in a sense, they're also, through him, they're judging Jesus as well. But if you're uh, familiar with the Gospel of John, this is a technique John uses. The Pharisees are actually bringing condemnation on themselves because they're, they're judging themselves by their response to, to Jesus, who, as we know from the previous chapter, is the light of the world. Um, and then verse 16, again, uh, verse 16 says, Some of the Pharisees said, actually, I didn't read this one yet. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But uh, others said, how can a man who was a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. Now that's very interesting to me. There's not a unified approach to this from these religious leaders, these Pharisees. Some are, are saying, uh, in response to the man's answer to their question, that uh, the Sabbath has been broken. This is obvious. A work has been done, has been done by Jesus, which is in violation of Torah. So this man, Jesus, can't possibly be from God because he has, uh, he has violated the Sabbath. And yet others who are there, of this we think this small group of Pharisees, others are, are saying, well, how can someone who's a sinner perform these miraculous signs, right? Listen to that again. How is this possible? Um, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So Jesus' works on the Sabbath are dividing this group into two camps, in a sense. And they can't decide which is right. But uh, it continues there in verse 17. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was he, no, it was your eyes he opened. Okay, now listen to that again. I kind of muff the reading here, but listen to this again. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? Now they're divided in their opinion, so they want the blind man to talk again. And the reason is, it was your eyes he opened. So what do you think? Okay, you're the one who received this uh, healing, so what do you think about this? And he replies, he said, he is a prophet. That's all he says. He is a prophet. Verse 17, if you're following along. Very interesting that, uh, that he says this. He is a, a prophet. So this man is being fully pressed by the Pharisees, something like that, to admit, finally, that there is something special about this Jesus. Um, previously, and you see he's growing here in a sense in his faith a bit, because previously he just said, all I know is his name Jesus and all I know is what happened. But now he's making a declaration, not a perfect declaration, but another incremental step in faith about Jesus' true identity. Okay, um, He simply says that he is a prophet. And notice here, just to make sure, uh, he's using the, uh, yeah, he's using the indefinite article, a prophet. Not the prophet, but a prophet, which is significant because if you remember from uh, Hebrew scriptures from Old Testament prophecy, um, there is this thought that the prophet, the one like Moses, will return during uh, and will initiate uh, and inaugurate, I guess, the Messianic times. So this is a sign of the Messianic times <clears throat> when the prophet, the prophet that was expected, the one to be like Moses, would return. But here he's just saying sort of in a generic way, right? He labels him as being 
a prophet because he doesn't really know who Jesus is and the Pharisees are kind, kind of, you know, pressing him into this to make some sort of a, a decision. So in verse 18, continuing, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents uh, of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Let me read this again. This is two verses, okay? Pretty important. So, and just to frame this again before I read verse 18 and 19, um, they get this initial answer from the man who had been formerly blind that he thinks Jesus is a prophet, but they still don't believe him, right? And they're divided as to who this Jesus is. Is he a sinner because he broke uh, the Torah, because he healed on the Sabbath? Um, but how can someone who's a sinner then do these signs? So they're divided, right? So where do they go? They go to the parents now. Now they go to this man's parents for some further information, all right? That's the next step. Go interrogate the man's parents, just to see if he really was blind in the first place. Maybe he really wasn't blind, is what they're going to find out, I guess, from the parents. So again, let me read this one more time. The Jews did not believe, and again, we see Jews, I keep reminding you, not the Jewish people, but the leadership, okay, the religious leadership, did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Okay, and I'll continue reading. His parents answered, we know that this is our son. Okay, we know this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. <laughs> Don't come to us. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. This doesn't seem, on the surface, to be a lot going on here, but this is a really critical passage in biblical studies, believe it or not, and I'll tell you why in just a second. So the Pharisees have come to the parents to get a clarification here, right? And the parents respond to this uh, uh, interrogation, in a sense, by the Pharisees in quite a different way than their son did. Their son, uh, the man who had been blind, is uh, sort of straightforward with them in some ways and says, I know this, is this man Jesus and I think he's a prophet because obviously look what he's done, okay? Um, the parents do this in a slightly different way. And they fear, and they basically say, you know, this man's of, of age, our son is of age, so go ask him. And the reason is, is that they are afraid that they will be put out of the synagogue, okay? So they don't want anything to do with this because they're afraid of this, the Jewish leadership, the Pharisees, they insist their son is old enough to speak for himself. So, this is an interesting reference, and here's we'll get back to this now. Uh, a very interesting reference of their fear to be, quote, put out of the synagogue. There is some thought in biblical studies that during this time, uh, although there's no good evidence for this, but there's some thought that um, those during the time of the Gospel of John, okay, and the Dates vary, it depends on what scholars you talk to. It's thought to be the last gospel written, that's the majority opinion, but that I don't actually hold to that. I think there's traditions in John that are very, very early in, in the process of telling the story of Jesus. But anyway, there is some thought that the community, um, the scholar Raymond Brown talks about the community of the beloved disciple, and that's how this gospel comes up. The community that John is writing to uh, had a problem because they were, uh, they were still Jews going to the synagogue and yet followers of Jesus. And what happened is, what we think may have happened anyway, is that the Jewish leaders put in a, uh, a benediction that each Jew had to recite in the synagogue that denounced Jesus as being the Messiah. So if you're a Jew and you're a follower of Jesus, identify as being a, a Christian, okay, but you're still a Jewish you know, practicing Jew and go to the synagogue, you couldn't recite that benediction. It's called the Birkat Hamanim uh, in Hebrew, and it simply is a statement saying Jesus is not the Messiah. And so there is this fear then 
um, uh, the reference to being put out of the synagogue if you're not willing to say this benediction in the course of the, the synagogue worship. So you see how that would divide people uh, during, uh, during Jesus' time. Uh, people would be uh, divided as to their allegiance. Uh, they identify themselves as Jews, they go to the synagogue, and yet they can't say this benediction because it professes that Jesus is not the Messiah. So it puts them in a quandary. So the question is then, is that what this is referring to here in this story of this man who has been born blind? Is that what this is about? Is that the evangelist, the fourth evangelist, saying here that to his community that we understand the situation, the parents of this blind man are fearful for the same reasons, they cannot um, uh, in, in good conscience uh, talk about um, Jesus being the Messiah because they're afraid. They're afraid of being put out of the synagogue. So, what do they do? They put it back on their son. They say, go ask him. He's of age, right? He can speak for himself. So there's a little bit of a nuance here. Here's the things uh, that are really important to, to dig deep into Scripture because these are the things that you can gloss over really quickly. So get a good study Bible. Get a good commentary. And take your time in reading through Scripture because it gives you the background information that is so in, important. So uh, we don't know if that's the case here for sure. It's all conjecture. I said there's no good evidence for this, but it's really interesting to think about these real people back then struggling with these real issues, these um, these people who self-identify still as being Jewish, and, and they go to the synagogue and they worship, and yet they feel that Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah had come and was uh, crucified, uh, died, and was raised. And so they're trying to hold both of these things in tension. And the, the synagogue leadership, the religious leaders, are trying to make a strong divide here and saying you can't be both. Either you're a practicing Jew or you are a follower of Jesus. So... A lot of intrigue going on here. And so that could be what this is all about with this whole episode with the parents. Kind of an interesting thing here. Um, so moving on then to verse 24. So for the second time, the second time, they, meaning the Pharisees, they called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. So now I guess these Pharisees are finally coming down on the side of, well, he healed on the Sabbath, so he must be a sinner. Don't, never mind the fact that sinners don't perform these good works, regardless, um, or, and, and he has to be a man of God because he's performing, obviously, a good work. No, they're saying we're, we're going to come down hard on the fact that it's the Sabbath and that this man is a sinner because of that. Because as we see in all the Gospels, but in, we've seen it many times with these signs, in John's Gospel, when you heal on the Sabbath, you have broken Torah, and you are labeled a sinner. So, for a second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, and now we get back into this theme of who's in the know and who isn't, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Simple, straightforward observation from this man. I don't know if he's a sinner. Here's all I know. Yesterday I couldn't see. Today I can see. It's almost that simple, right? They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already. <laughs> we have been through this, right? I'm not going to change my story. Here's, here's my story and I'm sticking to it. I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? It's actually almost comical in some ways what's going on here. Do you also want to become his disciples? So... Picture this. This man who had been blind is now able to see. Uh, his parents say to, to the Pharisees, go ask him. He's of age. He can talk for himself. And he is sort of baiting the Pharisees here. It's kind of a comical scene. You know, why do you want to hear this again for? Do you want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, it says in, in verse, uh, what do we got here? Verse um, 28. Then they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And that is the self-incriminating verse right there, according to the Gospel of John. Either you're in the know about Jesus or you're not. Either you're in the light or you're in the darkness. And this is a choice you make for yourself. Um, either you follow in the way of Jesus, you follow in the way of compassion and love and forgiveness, or you don't, or you don't. Either you are open to this new thing that God is doing, 
or you are uh, self-righteous and you think you already have it all nailed down, figured out, and buttoned up. Um, that's the, that's the, the whole point that John is trying to make here, um, I believe anyway. So they are incriminating themselves. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. They do not know where he comes from. Um, some interesting parts about this that, as I said, the man sticks to his story, and and the Jewish leadership here, the the Yudoi, the Jewish leadership, they are kind of reduced to sort of mocking him in, in a way, right? And um, and the argument continues. It's almost like they're going around in circles here, in a sense, and they're not getting anywhere. Um, but they say uh, this man says to them, you know, do you want to become his disciples as well. Is that why you're doing this? Is that why you're you're following uh, this line of of thinking, right? Um, now it's subtle, but hear this. Pick this part up too. We've said throughout this story that this man is growing in faith with each verse. It seems like at first he doesn't know who Jesus is. He just, when asked by his neighbors, he simply says, um, "All I know is this guy's name is Jesus, and I know what happened." I was blind, now I can see. That's all I know. And then initially he's talking to the Pharisees, and he's forced to reveal in some ways, well, this man must be a prophet. Um, not necessarily the Messianic prophet, because of the indefinite article that's used in Scripture, a, a prophet, not the prophet, but a prophet, someone who clearly has done something amazing here in this, this sign that he's working. Now, it seems to me like this man is already counting himself as one of Jesus' disciples um, by what he says here. Uh, and let's read through this part again just to try to pick up on that nuance. So they reviled him after he said to them, do you want to be his disciples also? They reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man... We do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. <laughs> Again, now the man is mocking the Pharisees. Here's something amazing. Consider this. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. You don't know where he comes from, yet look what happened. He opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. He is calling out the Pharisees here. He's smacking them down here with, uh, with these words. How can you possibly say that this man is not from God? Look what happened. Look what took place here, right? And he says in a mocking way, here is an astonishing thing. You know, here, I, this is amazing to think about. You don't know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. How can that possibly be the case? Um, so this is really sort of a significant uh, back and forth that's, uh, that's taking place here um, in this this back and forth between uh, the man who had formerly been blind and, and the Pharisees. So let's finish out this section. After he says this, verse 32, never since the world began, and now we're getting into hyperbole, the, uh, <laughs> the man who had been blind is just pulling out all the stops here against the Pharisees. He's very clever. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So you clearly see the development here in this man's mind, going from not knowing Jesus at all, just his name and what happened, to declaring him a prophet, to becoming one of his disciples, and clearly here saying, well, he must be from God, because look at what happened. Look at, look at this. Look at what he did for me. Look at the sign that's being performed here. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins. And are you trying to teach us? Here's the arrogance again of these religious leaders. And this is a lesson for all of us who find ourselves in positions of, of uh, leadership in the church, too. I, I always tell people, the, the more, uh, the more I, I, I grow, I guess, in a sense, in, in faith, the older I get, the more I realize I really have more questions than I do answers. Again, what I said yesterday, it's Richard Rohr's two halves of life, right? In the first half, we need that sort of structure. We need those definite answers for things in order to build that foundation of our faith. But as we get older, we're given permission to ask more questions. That's the second half of life. Pharisees are clearly stuck in the first half of life. Listen again to their, uh, their answer to the man born blind. They answered him, you were born entirely in 
sins. So they believe that his blindness for sure came from some sin that was committed. We talked about that, whether it was the sin of the parents or this man's sin. And, and uh, that's a question that's wrestled with in, in John. And Jesus often comes out and says, as he does in the beginning of chapter 9, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was blind for a different reason. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? We already know. We already know all there is to know. We have it all figured out. We have all these rules and these laws in place. And we have to, you have to follow those laws because we are, are the ones who are in control. You see, they are trying to play God in a sense. They are saying that they know more than God knows. They're not open to a new thing that God is doing. They are not in the know about Jesus. They are in darkness. That's a major theme in the Gospel of John. Either you are or you're not. Either you're with me or you're again me <laughs> uh, when it comes to Jesus. So they think that uh, there's nothing that they can learn. And we know a good disciple, a good person of faith, regardless of what your faith is, I would even say, is a lifelong learner. You're constantly learning. They're saying here, we have nothing to learn. You can't teach me anything because I already know. I'm already, uh, I already have it all figured out. And then it ends, and they drove him out. Verse 34 ends with this. So they, they drive this man away. Um, they're not getting from him what they want. So you see the subtle interplays that are happening here in this story, which is just fascinating to me as a, as a student of Scripture. It's uh, amazing uh, what's happening here. The background information that we talked about a little bit today it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating. So we're going to end there for today. And uh, the next time we pick this up, we'll start with verse 35. Um, when Jesus hears that this man has been driven out by the Pharisees, he's going to have something to say about all this. And uh, that'll lead us perhaps into talking a little bit about chapter 10 as well, as uh, we continue through the Gospel of John and uh, where Jesus talks about being the good shepherd. And uh, the humility of that as compared to the arrogance of of the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, according to John. So um, this story will end with a discussion about spiritual blindness versus real blindness, right? And Jesus as the light of the world will reveal that uh, the Pharisees and those like them are spiritually blind. So let's end it there for today. I hope you all have a wonderful day today. Let's see who else has uh, joined us as we were uh, chatting there for a while. Uh, Sandy, Sandy handles with us. Good. Good to see you. And uh, again, good to see you, Alan, back with us. Uh, stay safe. Um, for those who don't know, Alan is a, a nurse and uh, he is one who is on the front lines uh, battling this COVID-19 thing every day and had a chance to talk with him a couple weeks ago and, and uh, just checking in with him to see how he's doing. So Alan, thank you for all that you're doing and for all those uh, who are um, those um, uh, folks who are on the front lines uh, addressing this situation. Um, we really appreciate what you do. Uh, Lindsay Mitchell is with us. Lindsay, good to see you. Say hi to Sue for me, please. Uh, Chris Chichester, also with us. Good to see you on again, Chris. Our, our district superintendent checked in. Hector, I hope you're doing well. hope your, your wife is doing well, too, uh, during this time. I'm so glad to hear the great news that you've been uh, uh, offering to us uh, about her recovery. That's fantastic news, and continue to pray for her during this time. And uh, Barbara, Barbara, good to see you too. And, and I know you're going through cancer treatment as well. And uh, we're constantly thinking about you too at the church. So I hope you're, uh, hope you're doing okay and uh, finding your way through this. Friends, we continue. We continue in faith through this time. Um, we just want to make every opportunity available to gather in any way that we can, other than physically gathering, of course, but uh, through different means. Um, I will certainly uh, see you on Sunday for our 9.30 worship. Again, our, our worship movie is being put together even as we speak. And I uh, hope you enjoy the message. I actually did have a chance to record that message here. And uh, it'll, uh, it'll be good to, uh, to be with you again as we continue to go through this time. So be blessed. Hi, Patty. I see you just came on. Good to see you. Um, and we'll be talking soon, I'm sure. And... Uh, for those who don't know, uh, our chair of our council, Patty Gritson, has just been, and she probably doesn't want me to say this, but she has just been so instrumental in, in moving us forward and getting the, the PPP uh, loan slash grant from the government and also the EIDL loan as well. And 
thanks to Patty and, and others, of course, Karen Halligan did a lot, uh, Devika Gill did a lot as well. Um, but Patty was really the driving force in, in getting us uh, the, those monies from the government. And we, uh, um, I believe we were successful in doing that. I believe they're showing up in our accounts, which is, uh, is good news. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Patty, but I think that's the case. So just thanks again for, for all that you do for the church, Patty, and really appreciate uh, all your efforts. Anyone, anyway, have a great day. Be safe. Stay at least six feet away, if you would, but don't practice physical distancing. Uh, no, I'm sorry, practice physical distancing, but not necessarily social distancing. We can still remain social through virtual means. We have to stay apart physically, for sure, in order to stay safe, but we need to remain connected. And again, I encourage you to pick up the phone today, talk with someone. Um, we're trying to get initiatives going with small groups. We're working with Gina Yeshke from our our conference office to uh, help uh, uh, initiate even more, more small, small group engagement within the congregation. And it doesn't have to be anything major. It could be three, four people getting together on a Zoom meeting once a week and, and talking about uh, a particular topic or a, an interest or uh, going through uh, uh, Bible verses or um, time of devotion. It could be almost anything. The point is that as people of faith, as followers of Jesus, we need this connection and we need to continue that connection through this time. Anyway, I'm going on and on this morning, so or this afternoon. Uh, so have a wonderful day until next time, and we will continue our march through the Gospel of John. Take care and be blessed.